All right, you guys, welcome. We are going to skip chapter 15 for now and head on to chapter 16, and we're going to be talking about the special senses. So what are the special senses, right? Let's talk a little bit about that. And then we'll go through our two chemical senses, which is taste and smell. So we'll spend a little bit of time on those guys, but we're going to spend the majority of the lecture on the eye and the ear. And then a little bit about our disorders and development in our special senses. So what are the special senses, right? So um, taste, smell, sight, and hearing or sound are kind of all the ones we think about, right? But we can't forget about balance as well. So that's going to go kind of hand in hand with hearing. And when we learn about the inner ear, we're going to have two different structures in there, one for hearing and one for balance. And then our the sense touch is a large group of general senses. So we've really covered a lot about uh, touch with the integumentary system when we were talking about uh, types of receptors and those mechanoreceptors that are found uh, in the skin. So uh, touch we're not going to talk about because it's really considered a general sense instead of a special sense. So the special senses have special sensory receptors. So we've talked quite a bit now about our different types of sensory receptors that are picking up different types of senses in different parts of the body. So these guys are really just localized to the head region. So all of our special senses are in our head. And so these guys uh, are specific receptor cells. Okay, so they're a little bit different than some of the other receptor types that we've seen. They're either these neuron-like epithelial cells. So um, when we remember way back to our types of epithelium and epithelial cells, or they're actually these very small peripheral neurons. And if we go back to our different types of neurons, we talked about um, multipolar, unipolar, and bipolar. And so these guys are those unipolar um, types of uh, neurons. So a lot of them are, not all of them. And what they're going to do is all of these guys are going to pick up that sensory information and send it to the central nervous system and it, it's not really that far away so a lot of these guys are cranial nerves right so they're coming right off of the brain stem usually so it's right there and so these guys are very uh, close to the central nervous system So let's talk about our chemical senses first. So these guys are taste and smell, and the technical terms for taste and smell are gustation and olfaction. So get used to using that terminology because you'll hear gustatory, olfactory, things like that. So um, that's how we refer to taste and smell. And the receptor types, these guys are classified as chemoreceptors, so they pick up on chemicals. So if we go back to our different types of receptors and how we classify them, one way to classify them is what kind of uh, sense they pick up on. And so these guys respond to chemicals. So the food that we dissolve in our saliva or the airborne chemicals that are going to dissolve in the fluids of our nasal mucosa. So these sensory receptors are going to pick up those chemicals, those dissolved chemicals. So let's start with taste or gustation. So these guys occur in the taste buds. So if we remember back to kind of the surface of the tongue and we found some of these different types of taste buds and we call taste buds tongue papillae. Okay, so there's a couple different types of uh, papillae and only two of them uh, are actually are considered taste buds or contain taste buds. And those are our fungiform papillae, which are kind of the small dots found along the entire surface of the tongue. And then those valate papillae that kind of look like targets um, on the back of the tongue near that lingual tonsil. 
So there's only two types that actually contain taste buds and really the rest of those papillae are just for texture. You actually sense um, texture with your tongue or you know the texture of your food. It's how you can tell something is slimy or something like that so or rough right. So that's texture so they don't actually contain um, taste buds so only these two fungiform and ballate papillae contain uh, taste buds. So let's look at these taste buds a little closer and they're actually epithelial cells. So we actually contain a couple different types of these epithelial cells and the main one is the gustatory epithelial cell. These guys are essentially, uh, you can think of them like the receptor, uh, the sensory receptor. We said they could be epithelial cells or these little neurons, and they're actually cells. So they're the ones that are gonna generate that um, sensory impulse uh, through the nerve fiber to the central nervous system. So these guys are the main players, right? So they're the ones picking up on those chemicals. And then we have the basal epithelial cells, which are going to replace any sort of gustatory epithelial cells, cell if it's damaged. And so if we look on the right hand side, we can go through these pictures. The top picture is just kind of a section of a valate papilla. Okay, and so if we look on the side there, you see the, those little purple dots and those are the actual taste buds. Okay, so we've just enlarged one of those taste buds in the second image to show you those gustatory epithelial cells. So those are those purple cells and they have these really cool uh, long microvilli called gustatory hair cells or hairs. So each of these cells have these little gustatory hairs, but they're essentially just microvilli and they're going to extend through that taste pore. So there's essentially a little hole uh, that connects to the surface of the epithelium, <clears throat> which then those microvilli pick up on the chemicals that have been dissolved in the saliva. And then you see those little blue cells at the back and those are those basal epithelial cells ready to uh, replace any sort of damaged gustatory epithelial cell. And then the yellow are the um, cranial nerve fibers that are coming in to pick up that, that impulse, that sensory impulse to uh, send it through the cranial nerve. So we'll talk about our different cranial nerves that are um, connected to our taste buds. Okay, so we have a couple of them. And we said that there's kind of, you know, a rough environment in the mouth. So we have our stratified epithelial tissue. So what happens is they do get damaged quite often. And so they do have a high turnover and we just replace those epithelial cells every seven to 10 days. So those basal epithelial cells are really doing a good job replacing those gustatory epithelial cells, okay? So remember way back in the day when they were talking about uh, the taste map, right? So this part of your tongue tastes sweet, this part of your tongue tastes salty and bitter and vice versa. Well, they've kind of disproven that theory, but we do have different uh, basic uh, qualities of taste. So we do pick up on sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. And then they discovered that we actually have a taste for umami, which we're picking up um, the glutamate or MSG is essentially glutamate. And so that is a separate taste all in itself <clears throat> and a lot of you know, old chefs and things are really picking up on this whole, you know, it has a lot of umami flavor. So if you've never heard that, it's kind of a, a weird term, but it really is um, another taste that we can pick up on. And then they also recently discovered that we actually have a very specific water taste. So that's how you can tell if you like one type of water over another. So that's kind of an interesting idea as well. So how do we transfer this information that our taste buds are picking up in the tongue to our cerebral cortex? 
So essentially we have two main uh, cranial nerves that are innervating most of the taste buds on our tongue, and that's the facial nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve. So we'll talk about those guys um, a little bit more, uh, but we also have a, some taste buds on our epiglottis, and that goes through the vagus nerve as well. So vagus nerve does have a little bit of taste information, but we said it has a lot of other jobs as well. So what happens is those cranial nerves pick up on the sensory information, those chemicals, chemical information, and it passes it to uh, the uh, brain stem first. And you don't need to worry about the specific nuclei in the brain stem or anything like that. Just kind of know the general pathway uh, that this um, sensory information goes. And where did we say all sensory information goes through? The thalamus. So we have one exception, that's smell, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then the thalamus tells it to go to the gustatory area of the cerebral cortex, which is in that insula lobe that's kind of um, <clears throat> deep to the uh, temporal lobe. It's kind of underneath the temporal lobe. Because <clears throat> again, we have a very specific region in the cortex for gustatory uh, sensation. Okay, so that's how we get that information from the taste bud to the cortex and then we decide uh, what we want to do with that information. So now let's move on to smell or olfaction. So olfaction is actually these um, pseudostratified columnar epithelial cells. So it's found in the nasal mucosa like the roof of the nasal cavity is where that olfactory nerve comes in with the olfactory bulb. And then essentially we send down nerve fibers through the cribriform plate uh, to this olfactory epithelium. So we have three main cell types in this epithelium. And one is the olfactory sensory neuron, right? So that's really what's picking up the chemicals. And these guys are those unipolar neurons, right? So they have a cell body with uh, two um, projections coming off of them, okay? And then we have supporting epithelial cells, and those are our uh, kind of columnar cells and olfactory stem cells. So again, those guys can replace the epithelial cells as needed. So these cell bodies of the olfactory neurons, these guys have these little dendrites um, that project into the um, epithelial surface. And that's really where um, the chemicals are gonna be dissolved in the mucus. So they have these little olfactory cilia that are really going to be uh, the receptors for the chemicals that dissolve <clears throat> in that mucus. So those are the olfactory cilia, which are attached to those olfactory sensory neurons. So with smell or olfaction, there's kind of a sensory neuron chain that happens. So we said that we have those um, olfactory sensory neurons in the epithelium that are picking up um, the chemicals by those olfactory cilia. So they're going to pick up the chemicals and the axons of those guys are going to gather into these bundles that are called filaments of the olfactory nerve. And those filaments are what are going to be going through that cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. And these filaments are then going to synapse with these mitral cells. So the mitral cells are then going to transmit that impulse, that nerve impulse to um, the olfactory tract. Okay, so the bulb contains those mitral cells, all the axons of those mitral cells become the olfactory tract to take it to the central nervous system. And so the really interesting part about olfaction is it does not go through the thalamus, 
So it goes to the cerebral cortex, but it does not go through the thalamus. So that's our one sensory in information or input that does not get routed through the switch station of the thalamus. But what it does do is it does uh, talk directly to the limbic system. So what is the limbic system responsible for? memories and emotions, right? So if you've ever had an experience where you smell something and you have a very, very vivid, strong memory uh, that's connected to that smell, that's why. So you have this very strong connection with the limbic system and we kind of call it the smell, the smell brain. It's a very primitive um, part of our brain that we connect smell to the limbic system and we don't go through the thalamus. So just a very interesting part about smell. So let's go through a couple of disorders of these chemical senses. So we'll kind of do uh, disorders a little bit as we go through these different senses. So anosmia is the absence of the sense of smell. So this could be injury, uh, colds or allergies, or also even a zinc deficiency. I know probably most of us have had this due to probably cold, a cold or allergies. And so it's very interesting because without a loss of, or with a loss of smell, you also get a loss of taste. And so taste is very closely related to smell and taste buds really only de detect a few flavors without smell. So if you are sick or something, you always kind of notice that your food tastes really bland and that's because you don't have that smell to help um, with the flavors. And then there's also something called unsonant fits. And this is a distortion of smells, or they also call it olfactory hallucinations. So, and that's called fant, um, phantosmia. So essentially you have these phantom smells or hallucinations. And this is really interesting and they've seen it a lot after brain surgeries or head traumas. Um, but it can also be a sign of something bad, like a seizure, a stroke, or a brain tumor. And it's really often um, an irritation of the olfactory pathway. So you think you smell something good or something bad, um, something rotten, but there's no smell there. So it's considered a phantom smell. So those are really interesting and can be kind of a bad sign of some sort of um, head trauma. So now we're going to spend some time on the eye and vision because vision is really the dominant sense in humans. That's not the case for all animals, right? But we definitely rely very heavily on vision as a species. And just to prove that fact, if you look at all of our sensory receptors in the body, 70% of those are in the eye. Just think about that all of the sensory receptors in your body and 70% of them are in your eye. That is just crazy to think about, right? And then 40%, that's almost half of your cerebral cortex is involved in processing that visual information. So that is crazy, right? So majority of us, our sensory receptors are dedicated to vision and almost half of our brain processing power is dedicated to uh, vision as well. And so when we're talking about the eye, only as one sixth of the eye's surface is visible. So the majority is in the orbit. So we'll talk about the eye and kind of all of its layers and it's very cool, I love the eye. So let's start with some accessory structures of the eye or some of this um, superficial or external anatomy of the eye. And so we have eyebrows, which contain coarse hairs on, they're technically called superciliary arches, but we call them eyebrows and they help to keep light, uh, bright light out of the eyes. And then we also have eyelids, right? So they're also called palpebrae, plural. 
uh, and they're separated by the palpebral fissure. So when you open your eye and the separation between your two eyelids is considered a palpebral fissure, okay? And then they meet at the medial and lateral angles, right? So they come together and those areas where they come together we call commissures, right? So medial commissure or lateral commissure, okay? Or angles, you can use that as well. And then at the medial angle or medial commissure, we have what's called a lacrimal caruncle. So it's kind of this little reddish bump. Um, you could probably have all appreciated it. And um, it's kind of a remnants of a third eyelid. Uh, we don't have third eyelids like a lot of animals, but it's part of our lacrimal system. So we'll talk about um, lacrimation and tears uh, in a little bit. And then these last two structures are better seen in the next slide, but the tarsal plates are actually a connective tissue that are within your eyelids to help give your eyelids some rigidity. And then along the, um, the edge of your eyelid, you have what are called tarsal glands. And these are just modified sebaceous glands. So remember we said sebaceous glands are oil glands in our skin. So they're essentially oil glands to help keep your um, eyelashes um, lubricated. So if you look at the image, we can see those two structures a little bit better. So the tarsal plate is that connective tissue structure that gives it some structure. And then there's some openings, these tarsal glands that open at the margin of the eyelashes. And you can actually see those tarsal glands when you look up close at your eyelashes. So what are some other structures? So we have this transparent mucous membrane called the conjunctiva. And essentially it lines the surface of your eye and the insides of your eyelids. So on the insides of your eyelids, we call that the palpebral conjunctiva. Okay, so it kind of turns in um, on the inner surface of your uh, eyelid that's touching the surface of your eye. And then the actual um, membrane that's over the cornea or over the surface of your eye is the bulbar conjunctiva. And then at the bottom, you have a conjunctival sac, which essentially it just kind of collects um, tears, right? So lack the lacrimal um, apparatus. So the lacrimal apparatus keeps your eye moist, right? So it produces uh, lacrimal fluid or tears, and then essentially it is uh, drained through the nasal lacrimal duct. So the lacrimal gland that sits kind of on the uh, superior lateral aspect of your eye, so it sits right up there, and it's going to produce, kind of continuously produce lacry lacrimal fluid. And then it gets collected into the lacrimal sac and down into the nasal lacrimal duct, which goes into your nasal cavity, right? So nasal lacrimal duct. And this is why when you cry, your nose runs, right? So you have an overproduction of um, lacrimal fluid, and then it drains into your uh, nasal cavity. Now let's talk a little bit about the muscles of the eye. So these guys are called extrinsic muscles of the eye because they're external to the uh, globe. But there are six muscles that control our um, eye movement. And they all originate at the back of the orbit on what's called the annular ring or the common tendinous ring. And then they insert on the outer surface of the eyeball on the sclera. So we'll talk about that outer connective tissue layer in a minute, but that's really that white um, part of the eye. And so these guys are all going to insert on that sclera, and then when they contract, they're going to rotate the globe. So we have, they're all called um, a rectus of some sort or an oblique. So we have, if you think of the eye like a clock face, right? We have a lateral and medial rectus at kind of nine o'clock and three o'clock. 
and they're going to move our eye left and right, right? So left and right is um, is relevant to what they're you're talking about the right eye or the left eye, right? So they move them medially and laterally. And then you have a superior and inferior rectus at kind of 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock, and it's going to move the eye upwards and downwards. And then you have these two strange uh, muscles called the superior and inferior oblique, and they're going to insert at an oblique angle. So we'll talk about that in a minute and how they um, move the eye. So let's look at the eye as if it were a clock face, right? So we said that the lateral and medial rectus are fairly straightforward, right? Left and right. And then at the superior and inferior rectus are also very straightforward, up and down. But now we have this superior and inferior oblique, okay? So let's start with the superior oblique. So if you look up at the top, it's going to attach obliquely across the top of the eye. Now when it contracts, it's going to rotate the eye and you follow the little arrow. So essentially it's going to rotate the eye to make this down and out movement. So if you follow that um, arrow to the orange arrow, it's going to create this down and out rotation, okay? And then opposite, that inferior oblique, which attaches on the bottom side of the eye, kind of at like seven or eight o'clock down there, and think about how it's going to pull the eye if it contracts. And you follow that green arrow, it's gonna rotate it and it'll become kind of upward and inward, okay? So those are the movements of the eye. So the six muscles of the eye creating those six movements of the eye. So we also said we had three cranial nerves that are innervating all of these muscles. Now cranial nerve three, which is oculomotor, is doing the majority of the work. So it's going to innervate four out of the six. So superior rectus, medial rectus, inferior rectus and inferior oblique. So really kind of the, you know, top medial and bottom sides of the eye. And then the cranial nerve four or abducens is going to be um, doing the superior oblique. Okay. So that's going to just do that one down and out movement. Okay. And then cranial nerve uh, six, Actually, I think I switched them. So cranial nerve four is trochlear nerve doing the superior oblique. And then cranial nerve six is abducens and it's just doing the lateral rectus, okay? So just doing lateral rectus. So two of the three cranial nerves only do one muscle, whereas that oculomotor does the majority of them. So now let's talk about the anatomy of the eyeball itself. So all of these components of the eye are really going to be protecting and supporting these photoreceptors. So they're the ones that are going to be picking up on the light um, and they are the sensory receptors in the back of the eye. So it's going to help, all of these structure, structures are going to help gather, focus, and process the light uh, into these images. So the external walls of the eyeball are composed of three layers or three tunics is what we refer to them as. And we have the outer fibrous layer, the middle vascular layer, and the inner, um, we call it sensitive layer or neural layer, okay? And then inside the eye itself, we have a couple of cavities and it's going to contain fluid, okay? So we call the fluid of the eye humor. So humor is just fluid of the eye and we have two different types of fluid or humor in the eye, 
and we can separate the two cavities into an anterior cavity and a posterior cavity and they contain the two separate types of humor. So let's start on the most outer layer, and that's the fibrous layer. So the fibrous layer is actually composed of two different regions, and it's all connective tissue. And the majority of it is going to be the sclera, and that's that white opaque region. And really what it does is it provides a very good structure or shape to the eyeball. It's very thick and uh, hard. And it's going to also anchor those eye muscles. So he said all those eye muscles are going to insert on the sclera. And then we have the anterior portion, which is the cornea. Okay, so the cornea is clear. So it is um, a fibrous connective tissue structure, but it's clear. So you can actually see through it. And that's why you can see into the eye and see the iris. Okay, so where these two regions come together is called the limbus. So that's the junction between the sclera and the cornea. So everyone can see that junction on their own eye. It's where the iris starts. So it's where you can appreciate the iris compared to the whites of your eye or the sclera. And then we also have this area of drainage. So just like we were talking about that lacrimal system, we have this internal fluid in the eye as well that's being continuously produced. And so we have to drain it. And so we have a scleral venous drainage that allows that fluid or that aqueous humor to drain um, out of the eye. So now let's move on to the middle layer or the vascular layer. So this is really the middle of the eyeball and it comp is composed of three different parts. The majority of it is the choroid, but we also have these two other structures called the ciliary body and the iris. So the majority of us are probably familiar with the iris, so that'll kind of give us a good um, spot to identify. But let's start with the choroid. So the choroid is really this vascular, dark pigmented membrane, okay? And it's the majority of the vascular layer. Now it's brown in color. I know it kind of looks red in the image. And it is kind of a reddish brown and it contains many melanocytes. So if we go back to our skin and skin pigmentation, we said that melanocytes are the ones that are producing melanin. So we have these melanocytes in our eye, which you might think, why do we have pigments in our eye? And it's going to prevent the scattering of light rays within your eye. So it creates a very dark layer um, in the back of the eye. So it prevents scattering of light because dark things um, take up light, right? So that's the whole uh, point of the choroid, okay? And here's a very cool picture of um, the choroid just showing you how much vasculature, how much um, arteries and veins are making up um, a lot of that uh, choroid as well as the iris there too. So you can really see a good uh, vasculature. And I know the picture is kind of fuzzy and you can't read all of the labels, but I don't want you to worry about that. I just want you to appreciate how many um, vessels, uh, blood vessels are in this vascular layer of the eye. So now let's move on to the ciliary body. So essentially, the, think of the ciliary body like a ring, okay? It's just a ring of tissue. And what it does is it encircles the lens. And it has these little um, suspensory uh, ligaments that are going to come down from the ciliary uh, body and attach to the lens, okay? So the ciliary process is just the, the ring around the lens, okay? 
it's kind of the posterior surface of the ciliary body. So you can kind of see it looks kind of like it has a serrated edge. It looks kind of like a flower petal to, to me. And then the ciliary zonule has those suspensory ligaments, okay, those little uh, fibers that are going to attach and suspend the lens in the middle of the eye, okay? So the whole thing is the ciliary body, but it's composed of these, uh, the ciliary process and the ciliary zonule, okay? So the last part of the vascular layer is the iris, and this is the visible colored part of the eye. So this is what we can see when we look at somebody's eye, right? We can see the iris. And the iris is attached to the ciliary body. So it's kind of coming off that anterior side of the ciliary body. And what it is, is it's actually two smooth muscles. So if you look at the lower pictures, those lower three pictures, you can notice that there's two different muscles doing two different motions. So again, they're smooth muscles, so we have no control over them. It's part of the autonomic nervous system. And we have what's called the sphincter papillae muscle. And this kind of goes in a circular uh, pattern, okay? And it essentially constricts the pupil, okay? So when it contracts, it's going to make the pupil smaller, right? It's gonna constrict your pupil. And then we have the dilator uh, papillae muscle, which is going to dilate the eye. So it looks kind of like a radiating muscle around the outside. So when it contracts, it's going to dilate or increase the size of the pupil. And a lot of people think the pupil is actually a structure, but the pupil is just a hole. So it's a round central opening in the iris. Okay, and so you're just looking into the back of the eye when you're looking through the pupil. Okay, that's why when you go to the eye doctor and they shine something into the back and they look through their big magnifying glass, they're looking into the back of your eye, right? And they give you that, um, the drug, the drops in your eye to dilate your pupil so they can see everything in, inside and in the back of your eye. So we have what's called the pupillary light reflex, right? So if you shine a light in your eye, you should constrict your pupil. And that's just telling you that your the nervous system is working appropriately, that autonomic nervous system, to protect your eye because you really don't want um, a lot of light in the back of your eye. You want just enough. So now let's talk about the innermost layer of the eye and we term this the retina. So the retina is the deepest, uh, most sensitive or neural layer of the eye. And so it's what's picking up on light, right? And uh, transferring it as a signal um, to the brain, okay? So the retina is composed of two different layers. The first layer, outermost layer, is the pigmented layer. And it's just a single layer of melanocytes, and it's the closest layer to the choroid, okay? So if you look at the top picture, and you can see the outer sclera, right, the white structure, and then you have the middle kind of reddish brown layer as the choroid, and then you have the neural layer, or the retina, uh, composed of the neural layer and the pigmented layer, okay? So the pigmented layer is very small, but the majority of the retina is that neural layer, which is just a sheet of nervous tissue, okay? So the neural layer contains three types of neurons. So the majority of us are probably familiar with photoreceptors, and these are the cones and the rods. Right, so photoreceptor are that what are actually responsible for picking up the light as a sense, right, and transferring that signal to the brain. So what happens is those photoreceptors then are connected to these bipolar cells, and then the bipolar cells connect to these ganglion cells, 
And the axons of the ganglion cells are actually what are going to um, create the optic nerve, okay? So here I've laid out how we actually generate an image from light, okay? So we were talking about our photoreceptors and the other cells, so how do they communicate with each other? So the sensory impulse is when the light comes and hits the back of the eye, right? So the photoreceptor cells are what are going to pick up on the light uh, sense, right? So they're gonna signal the bipolar cells which are kind of in orange or reddish orange there. And then they are going to signal the ganglion cells, okay? So the ganglion cells are then the ones that have the axons that actually run on the internal surface of the retina. So they're kind of making that um, superficial surface of the retina. And they all run together and they form the optic nerve. Okay, so I like the little um, pathway on the bottom. It says that the pathway of light is coming in kind of left to right, and then our pathway of the signal is going right to left, right? So our light comes in, hits the back of the eye, uh, hits those photoreceptors, and then the signal is going to come back out through those axons of the ganglion cell and out that optic nerve to the central nervous system. So now let's talk a little bit more about those photoreceptors. So they are the ones that are picking up on the light signal and creating a nerve impulse. So we have two different kinds and they are rods and cones or rod cells and cone cells. And they are considered neurons, even though we call them cells. Uh, so rods are more sensitive to light. So they don't really like light. They don't need a lot of light. So that is what allows us to see in dim light. And then cones are the opposite because they actually operate the best in bright light. And they enable us to see high intensity color vision. So you could imagine in different species that maybe see better at night, would have more rods, um, and species like ourselves or maybe birds that have very good vision um, would have more cones. So now we'll talk a little bit more about the anatomy, you could say, of the photoreceptors. So they have these inner and outer segments, both rods and cones. And essentially the outer segments are the receptor regions because they contain these light absorbing pigments. And light particles essentially modify these visual pigments and you don't need to understand um, the process of that. And, but essentially what happens is that is what generates a nerve impulse. And the thing is about these outer segments and the photoreceptors themselves is they're very sensitive, especially to things like light or heat. And you may say, well, they need light, right? But remember, they are sensitive to light. They absorb light. So they really don't want a lot of light in the eye. And they also cannot regenerate if they're destroyed, say, by light or heat. So they actually, what they do is they continuously renew and replace their outer segments. So if the whole photoreceptor is destroyed, it cannot regenerate. But the outer segment is what is absorbing all the light and may get damaged. So essentially they're able to renew and replace those outer segments um, kind of continuously. So we've looked at kind of the microanatomy of the retina with the rods and cones, and um, now we're going to look at more of the specialized regions of the retina. So, you know, when we were talking about the ciliary body and the ciliary process, well, that's at the margin of the retina. And so that area we call the aura serrata. And essentially, it's just the posterior margin of that ciliary body where um, the neural layer meets um, the vascular layer. Okay, so there's no retina really um, behind the iris or the ciliary body.
And then at the back of the retina, towards the back of the eye, we have a region called the macula lutea, and it contains mostly cones. So we said that mostly cones um, are really going to see uh, bright light, give us our high intensity vision. So we're really trying to focus the light back into the back of the eye, into that macula lutea. And then in the center of it is the fovea centralis, and it contains only cones. So this is really the region of highest in visual intensity. So this is where we're trying to focus all the light um, into the back of the eye at that uh, fovea centralis. And then just right below that macula lutea, we have the optic disc. Now the optic disc is considered a blind spot because that is where the optic nerve exits that the back of the eye. And there are no rods or cones in this area and it's really where the nerve exits and the blood supply enters the back of the eye. So it's really a true blind spot. If light were to hit that part of the eye, you would not be able to see anything or pick up anything. And it's just right below that macula lutea. So what about the blood supply of the retina? So we saw that image um, a little while ago about the choroid and how many vessels make up the choroid. But the retina also has some blood supply and it gets it from two different sources. So the outer one third of the retina is supplied by the choroid. So those vessels or capillaries in the choroid are going to um, supply the outer part of the retina. And then the inner part of the retina or inner two thirds is supplied by the central artery and vein of the retina. So we said that the optic disc, that blind spot where the nerve exits also is where um, we have some arteries and veins that are entering and exiting as well. Okay. So when the, the uh, doctors looking into the back of the eye, they're actually looking at the vasculature of that central artery and vein. And so if you look at this image, this is looking at the a retina. Uh, this is what they're looking at. And so you can actually see the bright white optic disc. And then to the left of that is the macula lutea. So if you were to flip this picture 90 degrees, that would be more of the orientation of the back of your eye. And then you can see all of these um, arteries and veins emerging from that optic disc. So now let's talk about these internal chambers and fluids of the eye. So we said that the fluid in the eye is called humor. And we actually have two chambers or segments, you can call it. And when you look at the eye, this is a you know cross section or longitudinal section of the eye, you'll see that the, the lens and the ciliary body or ciliary zonules essentially divide the eye into an anterior segment and a posterior segment. So let's look more closely at the posterior segment or cavity first. And this is filled with vitreous humor. So we said that the fluids in the eye may have different consistencies. And this is more like a jelly-like consistency. And it's quite firm. It's kind of like the inside of a grape. And so it gives um, that the inside of the eye uh, some support. So it helps to maintain intraocular pressure and it also um, supports the back of the lens as well. So it keeps pressure kind of on the lens, but also on the retina posteriorly. So if you hear about people detaching their retina, um, that's where the, the layer, the retinal layer actually detaches from the choroid. Um, so the, the pressure from the vitreous humor helps to kind of keep the uh, retina in place. But another big job is that it helps to transmit and focus the light uh, coming into the back of the eye. It's another uh, bending surface. So we've got a couple things that are gonna bend the light that come into the eye that we'll talk about. 
So the anterior segment is actually divided into two chambers. So we call it the anterior chamber and posterior chamber. Now, where is that division? So we said the lens div divides the anterior segment and the posterior segment. And now the iris is going to divide the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. So the anterior chamber is quite a bit larger and it's between the cornea and the iris. And then the posterior chamber is between the iris and the lens. And the whole anterior segment is filled with aqueous humor. So think aqueous is more water-like. So it's very different from our vitreous humor that's more jelly-like. And it is continuously produced. So the aqueous humor is kind of like the CSF, the uh, cerebral spinal fluid. So it's a blood filtrate and essentially it's produced by the ciliary body. So the ciliary body, you can kind of think like the choroid in the ventricles in the brain. So it's a filtrate of blood and it's going to be continuously supplied. So that's where you need that uh, scleral venous sinus to drain the excess aqueous humor. And essentially it brings nutrients to both the lens and the cornea because neither one of them have a good blood supply. So they're just fibrous connective tissue and they really don't have a blood supply. So the nutrients in the aqueous humor are brought into the lens and the cornea. So let's talk a little bit more about the lens. So it's uh, just this uh, thick, transparent, uh, biconcave disc, meaning it's uh, curved on both sides, right? And it's held in place by those ciliary zonules or those little suspensory ligaments. And what it does is it helps to bend and focus the light coming into the back of the eye. So we said we had a couple of light bending structures, uh, the aqueous or sorry, vitreous humor being one of them. But the lens is really one of the big players in uh, bending and focusing the light. And we have um, fibers, so it's connective tissue fibers. And essentially they are packed together like layers of an onion and they are just folded proteins. So essentially new lens fibers are continuously being added. And so the lens is going to enlarge throughout, the, throughout our lives. But what happens is if these um, proteins are not folded perfectly, they're no longer transparent. And so um, what happens is if we no longer have a transparent lens, we call those cataracts. So we get cataracts in the lenses as we age because we're not folding the proteins and packing all the fibers correctly, um, then we get um, blurriness, right? So we get cataracts and they do have cataract surgery and things nowadays that are very successful to correct those cataracts. So we talked a lot about bending light. So eyes are an optical device, right? So it allows us to um, bring light into the back of the eye. So we're trying to converge these light rays onto a single focal point, and that is on the macula lutea, and even more specifically that fovea centralis where all of the cones live. And so we have these light bending structures. We said the lens is very important for bending light and um, both of the humors, but more, more so the vitreous humor. But we also have the cornea as well, the first structure that it's gonna go to. And so what happens is, is we're trying to get it to a specific point on the back of the eye. And what happens is, is we can actually adjust the, the lens so that we can uh, see either in a, at a distance or close up and that's called accommodation. So we're able to actually flatten the lens or bulge the lens depending on if we want to see far away or see close up. Okay, so what happens is 
if we want to see far away, that actually has to do with the sympathetic activation of our autonomic nervous system. And we'll learn more about uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic in that lecture. But essentially, you don't need to know the specifics of what we're doing to the lens for these different activations, but just know that for sympathetic, we want to see distance or it allows us to see distance. And then for parasympathetic activation, it allows us to see close up. Okay, so um, that's all called accommodation. We're able to adjust um, for distance and close close images. So now what is the neural pathway or the visual pathway of how we get that information uh, to the brain? So most of the information is going to travel to the cerebral cortex, but some of it does go to the midbrain as well. And so this is really our conscious seeing, right? So this is the pathway that begins at the retina and we activate those photoreceptors and we have our little pathway to the bipolar cells, which then go to the ganglion cells and all those axons exit as the optic nerve. So these tracks are then sent to the thalamus, right? So all the sensory information is going into the thalamus and then the thalamus tells it to go to the primary visual cortex. But what's really cool about uh, vision and our pathways is that we actually have partial crossover or partial decussation at that optic chiasm. So we have the optic chiasm sitting there and what happens is part of it stays on the same side and then part of it goes to the other side. So we send half of the information to one half of the brain and the other half to the other half of the brain. And that allows us to actually have depth perception. So that's very cool because if you cover one eye, right, and you only have one eye <clears throat> vision, we ha no longer have depth, depth perception. So you need both eyes talking to both sides of the brain. So what are some disorders of the eye and vision? So we know that we um, have nearsighted people and farsighted people. So this is very common. So what nearsighted, which is also called myopia, is that you can't see far away. So you can only see close up. And what happens is, is that it actually has to do with the shape of the eye. So the eyeball itself is too long and therefore the focal point actually falls short on the retina. So you're trying to focus the light and it focuses onto a point that just falls short of the retina. And then it's opposite for farsighted or hyperopia and you can't see close up. You can see far away, but everything close up is blurry. And again, it's the shape of the eye, but the eyeball is too short. And so the focal point actually falls beyond the retina or uh, too far behind the retina. And I have some pictures that um, show you the difference between nearsighted and farsighted. And then we also talked about cataracts, so cloudy lenses. And essentially what happens is you get the misfolding of proteins because you don't have enough nutrients to our deep fibers of the lens. And so then you um, have cataract surgery, you can replace the lens, um, and then you're able to see again. But we also have uh, some interesting things called a strabismus. So a strabismus just means a deviation of the eyeball. <clears throat> so this can be a weakness or a paralysis of one of or more of those extrinsic eye muscles. So essentially what happens in this image, there's a medial strabismus so that the eye is actually going to um, look towards the inside, right? Towards the medial side. So essentially, if you can think about, is it the muscle or is it the nerve as well? So it could be either um, the muscle that's affected or the cranial nerve that is supplying that muscle. So if we have a medial strabismus, 
<clears throat> which cranial nerve or muscle is affected. So it might be the opposite of what you think. So what happens is the lateral rectus, right, which we said was innervated by the abducens nerve or cranial nerve six, <clears throat> because it only innervates one muscle. So if that lateral rectus isn't working, then that means the medial rectus, rectus is overcompensating and essentially pulls the eye inward. So that's a medial strabismus. So this is just the image showing you the difference between nearsighted and farsighted and the shape of the globe or the eyeball itself and how the focal point is uh, either too short or too far away. And so we essentially use lenses, right, to correct that focal point. So then we uh, get it to the macula lutea using a corrective lens. And again, don't worry about um, the different corrective lenses that are needed for the different um, nearsighted and farsighted. So let's talk a little bit about the embryonic development of the eye. And again, don't get too caught up in the details, but essentially it's developed uh, from an outpocketing of the diencephalon. So we said that the diencephalon is where the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus um, live, right? So essentially, there's also an overlaying ectoderm, right? So we said the ectoderm is what is going to develop into our nervous tissue. And so essentially, there's an area that thickens and becomes the lens placode. And the lens becomes the lens vesicle, which then becomes the lens. And then internally, you have the optic vesicle that's from the diencephalon, and that becomes the optic cup, which then becomes the retina. So that's the nervous tissue part um, of the eye. And then this just walks you through a little more detail of development if you're interested, but again, don't worry about all the step-by-step -step details. All right, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the ear, which is responsible for both hearing and equilibrium. So it has the internal uh, ear, which is uh, what is responsible for both hearing and equilibrium via the vestibulocochlear nerve, which is that cranial nerve eight. So if we talk about the different regions of the ear, most of us are very familiar with the outer ear, and then we have the middle ear and the internal ear. So really the outer ear and the middle ear is all responsible for hearing and focusing the sound waves um, into the inner ear, okay? So let's first talk about the outer or external ear. And what you can see, we refer to as the oracle or pinna, and it helps to direct sound. It's how you can tell where sound is coming from. And then we have the external acoustic meatus or the auditory canal. And this has hairs, sebaceous glands, which are those oil glands, and ceruminous glands. So we have uh, earwax, right, and some oils and some hairs to just kind of try to keep out um, any sort of particles that might be going into the ear. And then at the border between the outer ear and the middle ear, we have the ear drum is what we're used to calling it, but the technical term is the tympanic membrane. So it's the boundary between the external and middle ear, but the job is to actually create a vibration uh, from the sound waves coming through that auditory canal, and then it's going to vibrate our middle ear bones. So we actually have little bones that are inside the middle ear called ossicles and so that tympanic membrane just like a regular drum is going to vibrate and therefore vibrate those little bones inside our middle ear So the middle ear, we also refer to as the tympanic cavity. It's a very small space and it's air filled. 
So it's within the petrous part of the temporal bone. So remember the temporal bone had kind of a bulbous area and that's where both the middle and the inner internal or inner ear live. So we have this medial wall okay so towards the inner ear and we have two windows the oval window and the round window so the oval window is important because it's right next to one of those middle ear bones and what happens is as those bones vibrate because of the tympanic membrane it's going to vibrate that window okay the oval window and then the round window is just kind of a flapped opening and it's to allow for equilibrium within the ear um, so it um, so you don't pop your ear right and then you also have a tube so we have the auditory canal and we have the auditory tube which is also called the pharyngotympanic tube so it connects the tympanic cavity or the middle ear with the pharynx or the back of the throat a lot of people also call it the eustachian tube and essentially it allows for equalization of air pressure between the middle ear and the outside air pressure so this is what actually pops when say you go on an airplane or something like that and you have to pop your ears right or you chew gum to help pop your ears so that's the eustachian tube or this auditory tube so what are these little bones that are inside the middle ear they're called auditory ossicles and they're the smallest bones in the body they're super tiny and they are there are three of them and they're all attached to each other and they attach to the eardrum and that oval window so the first one is called the malleus and the malleus attaches to the actual tympanic membrane it also looks kind of like a hammer if you look at it at a certain angle so it's nicknamed the hammer and then the middle one is called the incus and so it connects the malleus with the stapes and then again it also looks kind of like an anvil so they call it the anvil and then the last one that's connected to that oval window or vibrates that oval window is the stapes and it looks like a stirrup and this is the one that i think really actually looks like the nickname if you turn it on its side it really does look like a stirrup uh, to a saddle so now let's work our way through the internal ear because this is really where all the magic is happening this is where the hearing and balance or equilibrium is located so they also call it the labyrinth because it's kind of twisted and turny and there's lots of um, interesting things about the internal ear and it also lies within that petrous part of the temporal bone just like the middle ear so we have the bony labyrinth which is the actual cavity within the bone within that petrous part of the temporal bone and it's uh, delineated into three different parts and the first one is the cochlea and the cochlea looks kind of like a snail shell okay and then the second part actually the second and third part kind of go together and the vestibule is just kind of the rounded area which connects to the semicircular canals so they just look like uh, little loops that are connected off the vestibule so the cochlea has to do with hearing and the vestibule with the semicircular canals has to do with balance or equilibrium so now if we look inside that bony labyrinth we find what's called a membranous labyrinth so these are a series of membrane walled sacs and they're sacs and ducts that are filled with fluid so they essentially fill out the bony labyrinth so they go with the bony labyrinth and they're kind of named um, consistently with them as well so inside the cochlea we find the cochlear duct so again it's just a membrane walled sac full of or duct full of fluid <laughs> 
And then the utricle and saccule, so there's kind of these two rounded structures within the vestibule. So the vestibule itself is a big rounded structure. And then you have the utricle and saccule that live inside that. And then they, the semicircular ducts live inside the semicircular canals. So again, the ducts and the sacs are the membranous labyrinth, whereas the canals are the bony part of the labyrinth. So let's look at these three individual structures within the internal ear. So first let's break down the cochlea. So that's the one that looks like a snail shell. And essentially it's a spiraling chamber around this kind of bony pillar called the modiolus. So the modiolus contains the cochlear nerve that um, is for hearing. Okay, so the cochlear nerve is the one section of the vestibulocochlear nerve, and it is responsible for picking up uh, sound. So the cochlear duct, which is part of that membranous labyrinth, contains what's called the spiral organ. So the spiral organ is really the receptor area that picks up on sound. So it's receptor epithelium, and it lives on the basilar membrane of the co cochlear duct. Okay, so if we blow it up, this will make more sense in the next slide. So we're going to blow up the spiral organ and take a look at what it, uh, what the basilar membrane looks like, what everything looks like within that duct and the spiral organ. So we have cells that live in the spiral organ. We have some so supporting cells and some hair cells. And the hair cells are the actual receptor cells. So they're the ones that are going to be picking up on those sound waves and transferring it to the cochlear nerve. So let's take a look at that spiral organ. So we're going to blow it up so that we can see all the details. So if we just take one of those um, ducts, one of those spirals, and uh, make a cross section through it, you can actually see that there are uh, three fluid filled cavities. And the cochlear duct, which is the one in the middle, is the one we're really concerned about because that's the one that contains the spiral organ, which contains our hair cells, which are picking up on the sound waves. So we do have those two other uh, structures full of fluid as well around the cochlear duct, um, which is the vestibular duct and the tympanic duct, but don't worry as much about those. So the area that is squared is going to be our spiral organ. And then we've blown that up on the right hand side to actually look at that basilar membrane, which is what the spiral organ and the hair cells and supporting cells sit on. And so if you notice, the hair cells are in darker blue and they're the ones that are connecting to that cochlear nerve or the fibers of the cochlear nerve. And we have actually inner and outer hair cells and that's less important, just really remember that the hair cells are our receptor cells. And the inner hair cells are the ones that are going to transmit the vibrations in the fluid of that cochlear duct to the basilar membrane and to the actual nerve. And then the outer hair cells actually kind of tune and amplify the signal. So it just kind of fine tunes the sound waves and the signal. So the inner ear cells are or the hair cells are really the ones that are, you know, picking up those vibrations. Here's just the overall image from your textbook showing how we have made those cross sections, transverse sections uh, through the cochlea to be able to see the cochlear duct and the spiral organ with those hair cells. So you can go through that and kind of take a look at all those um, individual structures. But again, don't worry too much about all the fine details. Um, just know the cochlear duct, the spiral organ, and the basilar membrane with those hair cells.
So here's a great image and I also have a video for you guys uh, on canvas as well showing how the inner ear works but essentially the sound wave is going to travel through that auditory uh, canal hitting that tympanic membrane which vibrates those auditory ossicles and vibrates that oval window which then vibrates all the fluid within those ducts of the cochlea. And that sound wave is going to travel along the basilar membrane until it hits a certain area uh, where the frequency is going to hit that hair cell that picks up on that frequency and it's going to transmit those frequencies into a neural impulse which is then picked up by that cochlear nerve. So here's the link for the hearing video, but I've also posted it on Canvas for you guys as well. So now let's take a look inside the vestibule. So the vestibule is kind of the central part of that bony labyrinth. So it sits right next to the cochlea and it's connected to those semicircular canals. And within the vestibule, we have the utricle and the saccule, which are the membranous structures that are located within the vestibule. So there's two rounded structures within the vestibule. And then within those two structures, we have these egg shaped parts that are kind of part of the membranous labyrinth and they're called a macula. So each the utricle and the saccule have this area called a macula and it's a spot of sensory epithelial tissue. Okay, so within that membranous labyrinth. And they're, they're oriented um, opposite. So if you notice the, the utricle is actually oriented more horizontally while the saccule is oriented more vertically, or I should say the macula in the saccule and in the utricle are oriented the two different ways. Okay, so one's horizontal, one's vertical, and that'll make sense for what it's actually picking up on. So let's take a look at the macula. So a lot of people have heard, oh, we have little stones in our ear right and that is really actually true so we have these little things called otoliths that are actually going to help us figure out our head position okay so within the macula again we have receptor cells that are surprise called hair cells again so the hair cells are our receptor cells and they are what are going to monitor our head position when our head is um, still in place. So not when our head is moving, but when our head is in place. So these hair cells are going to synapse with the vestibular nerve. So this is the other portion of the vestibulocochlear nerve, right? So we have the cochlear nerve going to the cochlea, and now we have the vestibular nerve going to the vestibule, okay? And so what happens is, is there's this um, this kind of membrane, otolith membrane, that sits on top of the hair cells. So the little hair cells has projections up into this membrane, and then there's little crystals of calcium carbonate sitting on top of that membrane, and they're the otoliths. They're the kind of little um, stones, if you want to think of them, but they're more like crystals. And essentially, when you move your head, you tilt your head forward, those otoliths are going to um, move the whole membrane uh, forward, if you're tilting your head forward, and it's gonna trigger the movement of those hair cells that are stuck in that membrane. Okay, so you're able to tell when you your head is upright and when you can tilt when you tilt your head forward or backwards, right? So the vestibule is really responsible for your head kind of head tilting, right? So in still in place with those otoliths moving um, that otolith membrane triggering those hair cells. So now what about your head in movement? So let's look at the semicircular canals. Now these guys are kind of attached to the vestibule. 
and we have kind of three different semicircular canals. Two, the anterior and the posterior, are going to be in the vertical plane, okay? So they're gonna be kind of up and down, just like we had a vertical uh, part of the vestibule, right? And then we have the lateral semicircular canal, which is in the horizontal plane, okay? And then within those canals, we have that semicircular duct, which is the membranous labyrinth full of fluid that's going to go through all those semicircular canals. So if we look inside those, the membranous labyrinth or the semicircular ducts, we find kind of toward the vestibule an enlargement of the duct and that we call the membranous ampulla. So the membranous ampulla houses a structure called the crista ampullaris. And the crista ampullaris is what contains that sensory epithelium. Okay, so that's gonna be what is connected to that vestibular nerve as well. So what does the crista ampullaris pick up on? So this is the sensory epithelium that contains both supporting cells and receptor hair cells. So again, they have these um, hair kind of stereocilia that are coming off of the cell, which is um, into the fluid. So it um, projects up into the fluid and it is going to be connected to the fibers of the vestibular nerve as well just like those, the macula in those utricle and saccules, okay? So the flow of the endolymph is the fluid we call endolymph inside these ducts. Don't worry as much about that, but essentially it's going to detect any sort of flow within the duct is going to cause those hair cells to bend. And so this is how we can detect rotational movement or rotational acceleration in our inner ear, okay? So this is just an image from your book showing how those hair cells in the ampulla are picking up on rotational movement. So essentially the flow of that fluid or that endolymph is going to move the hair cells and so you're able to pick up on that rotation. So this is just showing the auditory pathway or the ascending auditory pathway of how those cochlear receptors are going to get to the cerebral cortex. So they're gonna pass through the, the brainstem or the medulla. And again, don't worry too much about the nuclei in there, but it's gonna make its way you know, through the brainstem, eventually to the thalamus, right? Because all that sensory information, except smell, is going to go through the thalamus, and then the thalamus is going to direct it to the primary auditory cortex. So the equilibrium pathway is a little bit different. So the equilibrium pathway, it's gonna transmit the information on head position, which is the vestibule, and movement of the head in the semicircular canals. Um, but where it goes is it actually goes mostly to the lower brain centers or the brain stem. And these are the reflexive uh, centers, right? So we actually have a reflexive response to equilibrium because um, yes, it sends information up to the cerebral cortex as well, but if you sense a disturbance in your equilibrium, you actually can catch yourself before you fall, right? So you consciously don't say, oh my God, I'm falling, let me catch myself. You're automatically going to to catch yourself before you kind of consciously realize uh, what's happening, which is really interesting and obviously a defensive um, behavior, right? Because that would be bad if we just always fell down. So we have these lower brain centers, these reflex centers to help us um, when we're falling, okay?
So we do send um, information to both the cerebellum and the cerebral cortex, especially to coordinate uh, some of those complex movements, right? So we're obviously talking to the higher brain centers as well, but we do have a lot of information going to the lower brain center to try to um, save ourselves before we fall on our face, right? So what are some disorders of hearing and equilibrium? Well, many people um, get motion sickness, right? Either car sickness, sea sickness, or, you know, rides, going on rides. And a popular theory for motion sickness is that you have a mismatch of sensory inputs. So essentially your vision or your eyes are telling you one thing and your body is telling you something different, right? So there's kind of a mismatch of information and therefore uh, that uh, causes you to have motion sickness. Also deafness, right? So any loss of hearing is considered deafness, but there are two very different reasons for becoming deaf. And the first type is conduction deafness. So essentially your, the sound vibrations cannot uh, be conducted to the inner ear. So there's some sort of pathway interference, whether that's gonna be a ruptured tympanic membrane, an ear infection, right? So instead of your middle ear being full of air, it's full of fluid, right? Or pus or something like that, something gross. And so it keeps that those sound waves from getting to the inner ear. You also have some disorders of the ossicles too otosclerosis. So there are some different things that can cause conduction deafness. But then we also have sensorial, sensory neural deafness. And so this is any sort of damage to the actual auditory pathway or the neural pathway. So that can be anywhere from uh, the actual cochlear nerve um, to the central nervous system structures as well. Okay, so here are our learning objectives for this lecture. I know it was very long. Uh, we made it through. So there just are a lot of uh, details within the eyes and the ears. So just work your way through those um, and look through these learning objectives and make sure you're on the right path. So our next lecture is going to be the endocrine system. Okay, so we're going to do the endocrine system and then we'll finish up with the autonomic nervous system at the end of the unit. And then if you would like some more uh, study questions for the special senses, here are some multiple choice short answer and critical thinking from your textbook.